A picture's worth a thousand words. And every picture tells a story, sometimes a seedy story. By using an airbrush or Photoshop, the picture can be manipulated to tell a different story. Take the early 20th century Soviet Union. Here's the original picture where Vladimir Lenin addressed Soviet troops. He's on the left. In the lower foreground is Leon Trotsky and Lev Kamenev, both of whom ran afoul of Joseph Stalin. Stalin decided to rewrite history. And after having Trotsky assassinated and Kamenev executed, he had their images airbrushed out from the official history. Manipulating images isn't something limited to nefarious politics in the USSR, however. With the advent of Photoshop, one can take an image like this of a real person and change it to become something like this. Is anyone surprised that magazines alter their models' appearances to make them more beautiful than humanly possible? Some celebrities and models are fighting back, however, spilling the beans that their images were altered without their consent. Such altered images circulate beyond the runways of Paris and New York and impact the consciousness of ordinary people to strive for a humanly impossible, digitalized perfection. Once people went to plastic surgeons with a picture of their favorite celebrity. But now they're coming with heavily edited versions of their own pictures, wanting to physically alter themselves to resemble their digitally altered selfies. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Facetune, and Snapchat each have filters that can add freckles, lengthen eyelashes, widen eyes, and give us flawless skin. This worrying trend triggered a Journal of the American Medical Association article last year on what's called Snapchat dysmorphia. These altering trends perhaps explain the appeal of Mark Michelson's book, Least Wanted, A Century of American Mugshots, containing over 10,000 mugshots from the 1870s to 1960s. This rogues gallery appeal lies in the fact that things actually are as they seem. No editing, no airbrushing, the only thing added is a prisoner ID number. Mugshots are authentic images of people in hard luck moments at their lowest unaltered reality. Mugshots of criminals and the pictures we find in Hosea have something in common. Let's take a look. In this light, Hosea is like a mugshot book with its own authentic images and hard luck stories. Pictures of God's people at their lowest. Hosea, wife, and kids have got to be the most dysfunctional family in the world, ready for a trash TV appearance. We can just imagine the episode. It would be titled, The Prophet and the Harlot with salacious details about innumerable marital infidelities, illegitimate children, DNA paternity tests, and censored sights and sounds. And yet, that's the point. God is quick to admit it. The relationship between God and Israel has become completely dysfunctional, and God's ready to throw in the towel. And Hosea is invited to demonstrate just how badly this relationship has deteriorated. Each face in the family album tells a piece of God's, of God's and God's people. And since it tells a story about God and God's people, we'll find 
our faces in that album too. Let's take a peek at mugshot number one, Hosea. Hosea is commanded to marry a woman who is an adulteress and a lover, who has a lover. Think of the media frenzy that would descend upon this story. Preacher marries prostitute. It's sad that while clergy scandals have become cliche in our news, nobody is reporting on Hosea-like faithfulness in the ministry. One picture tells two stories here. Hosea's marriage is a narrative of God's fidelity to Israel and consequently to us today. The prophet incarnated his message, sending a picture of God's unmerited goodness and unbounded patience. The snapshot of Hosea reminds us of who God is, a patient life mate who endures with grace all manner of infidelity against him. But the image of Hosea models something of God's people as well. Simple obedience. Scripture doesn't say that Hosea thought about Mary and Gomer, or prayed about it, or entered, entered into the counsel of others about it, or complained to God, or chose to find himself a more appropriate wife. It plainly says he went and took Gomer as his wife. What limits does our obedience have? Will we lay down future dreams for the kingdom? Will we move to any country to serve God? Will we give more than feels comfortable? Will we purchase based on needs and not wants? Will we seek relationships with hard-to-love people? The first mugshot is of Hosea, held up like a mirror to ourselves. Let's turn the page to the next mugshot, that of Gomer. This mugshot is convicting. Gomer has spent her life sleeping around, seeking comfort and fulfillment in relationships with men. Now married to Hosea, she continues her unfaithful ways. She goes outside of a relationship of committed love and acceptance to seek fulfillment through false promises elsewhere. Gomer is a picture of Israel, guilty of idolatry by allowing anything else to come first before God. But here is the rub of this prophetic message. Hearers then and now are supposed to find themselves in Gomer. We have to take a hard look at this criminal image. This is actually a picture of a woman who became addicted to methamphetamine with disastrous consequences. Drugs became her god and nothing else mattered. We're so uncomfortable with the concept of prostitution that we can hardly see ourselves in her. But the image should not be avoided, sanitized, or airbrushed away. How are we giving ourselves away to the world around us? How are we idolatrous in our spending, in our priority on our image, in what we allow into our minds, in too many hours given to our careers, in striving to keep up with the Joneses? How are we selling ourselves short how have we cheapened ourselves? God's faithfulness is not understood without recognizing our own unfaithfulness. And it's hard but healthy for us to see our sin and idolatry in its relational context as a marital violation of the covenant to be faithful to only one. 
The second mugshot is Gomer, held up like a mirror to ourselves. Now we turn to the rest of the family. The children of this union are now identified and become warnings of impending judgment. The third mugshot is Jezreel. Jezreel means God scatters, like a child abandoned by parents left to his own fate. His portrait is of gruesome murders by former King Jehu in the valley of Jezreel. This son is a warning to the rulers of Israel that God will bring an end to their reign because of the violence they committed. For us today, the picture is a sobering reminder that God does not forget sin, and sin can carry painful consequences and repercussions. How do rulers of nations today use violence for their own ends? How do we as citizens of the soul superpower participate in that violence ourselves? While we may try and absolve ourselves of violence committed on our behalf on foreign battlefields, we cannot so easily pardon ourselves for the casual violence we commit online daily. Didn't Jesus say, you have heard it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. In God's eyes, the attitude of anger expressed in insults is equal to the act of murder itself. And we are liable to judgment. Christians are to be peacemakers. For as Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. If we are participating in anger, fulminating and fomenting it, ranting and raging in it, then we are no longer children of God, but children of hell. Jezreel is a reminder that rulers and nations and individuals will come to an end because of the violence they commit. What's happening in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, Niger, Syria, and on social media will have a generational impact on our children and our children's children. We're 18 years and counting of the global war on terror to eradicate evil from the world with no end in sight. We're 15 years and counting since Facebook launched with no end in sight. <laughs> Originally called Face Mash, it objectified fellow students by comparing headshots of who was hotter. Anybody surprised that with the seeds of such a divisive origin, we have such fruits of fury now? Anybody surprised that a former Soviet KGB director would exploit Facebook to set Americans against one another? We're deluding ourselves if we think our present actions won't have serious consequences. The third mugshot is Jezreel, held up like a mirror to ourselves. The fourth mugshot is Lo Ruhama, 
Lo Ruhama is the daughter, and her name means not pitied. Imagine the reminder this child was called every time by name. God will be merciful toward Judah in the south, but will not pity Israel in the north. This picture of God can seem capricious and unfair, especially to those new to the faith. But we're reminded again of elements of God's true character. While Judah received mercy for a while, it wasn't because Judah was deserving of it. If leniency and pity are given based on merit, we call this the justice of God. If God withholds or extends mercy when neither half of the nation is deserving of it, we simply witness the mysterious mind and will of God. The truth is, we almost always don't get what we deserve from God, rather than the opposite. Who are the people we've not pitied? Who have we withheld compassion from? Whom have we hardened our hearts toward? Whose suffering strikes no chord of mercy within us? The fourth mugshot is Lo Ruhama, held up like a mirror to ourselves. The last mugshot is that of Loami. Loami is the second born son and means not my people. The image of this child shows a God with limits. God calls his chosen people not my people and says he is not their God. God gives up and throws up his hands in despair. God's not willing to force anyone to love him or be in covenant with him. So God honors our choice to ignore God. We'd like to think that forsaking us is not something that God ever did, does, or would ever do. If, however, forsaking is defined as God acquiescing to our rebuffs, then God can be said to forsake us. In that case, God did forsake God's people. In that case, God did accept our rejection. Who are the people we've given up on? Who are those that we believe are not God's people? Who are those that we consider outside God's covenants? Who have we forsaken? The fifth mug shot is Loami, held up like a mirror to ourselves. These last four mugshots of Gomer and her children tell the story not only of our forsaking God, but God forsaking us. And if that's where this dysfunctional family album ended, it would be a sad and sorry state of affairs. God or Hosea could understandably walk away, cut their losses, and divorce Israel or Gomer and be done with them. Justice would have been getting what they deserved. Instead, God does something unexpected. God decides to once again woo Israel, alluring her speaking tenderly to her, taking her for his wife forever in righteousness, justice, steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness. Gomer's and Israel's infidelities will be forgotten. They'll have a fresh start and a renewal of vows. 
undeserved and unexpected forgiveness will be extended to them and to their children. To Jezreel, whom God had once scattered, God will now sow him. To Lo Ruhamah, whom God had not pitied, God will now have pity. To Lo Ami, whom God had said, not my people, God will now say, you are my people. Justice would have been remaining their dysfunctional selves, getting what they all deserved. However, they got better than what they deserved. They got mercy and forgiveness, and with that, a chance to make a new life together. Their mugshots take on a different light. They haven't been photoshopped, but they've definitely been grace shopped. Grace can change even ugly mugs like ours into things of beauty transforming us from one degree of glory to another until our face comes to resemble Christ's own. Thanks be to God. Amen.